We've got a rather special event uh, planned for this afternoon, uh, and so I'm going to hand over to Rich Pankos in a second, but I was reminded this morning on the news, because the last time I was in touch with Steve was when I happened to be in Chile, he had just returned, and we were trying to, I was trying to get some information about the collaborations he had, of course, uh, you heard last night about the earthquake, severe earthquake, and, and then the tsunami in Chile, so I think it brings into focus the topic that's been tailored for me. So I would just like to say on my behalf, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and hand over to Rich Pankos. Thanks, Tim. And, and thanks as well, Tim, for sort of letting us borrow, borrow this uh, faculty symposium in order to do this. What we'd like to do is we want to take the advantage of, of Steve's presentation to award him a Cabot Fellowship. The Cabot Fellowships were launched about a year ago by my predecessor, Paul Bates. Unfortunately, Paul can't be here today, but he certainly sends his congratulations. We awarded four of these fellowships, one to Steve Sparks, one to Wendy Larner, one to Peter Head, and one to Julia Slingo. Um, we wanted to have a big event honoring all four of them, but getting all four of them and Sir John Bennington in the same room together at the same time was impossible. So we, so we are going to rule them out one at a time, taking advantage of all of these opportunities, and, and that might be fun in its own way, because it'll allow us to actually focus on each individual. I don't want to talk too long, because Kathy Cashman's going to give a proper introduction to Steve. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. It, it, it's already written, too late to change it. Um, and I thought for a moment, uh, when I was thinking that, and, and Kathy and I talked about this, of, you know, we should mention all of the accolades, and we both thought, there's no point mentioning the accolades. Steve has numerous, far too long to mention. We all recognize that, and, and we both want to make this a little bit more personal. So in terms of the fellowship, let me just read what we've written here. It recognizes his outstanding contributions to the Institute and to Earth Sciences, and his continued support for interdisciplinary research that responds to the challenges of living with global uncertainty. Now, if I were to pull that apart, the first thing I would say is that what really impresses me about Steve is that you have done such a magnificent amount of fundamental research all the way to research that genuinely has profound impact on society. <clears throat> to achieve that, you have worked across <clears throat> disciplinary boundaries, not always, but when appropriate, with a wide range of people within the university and outside. And to achieve that, and from a personal level, what I have always found most impressive is that you have built communities via trust and mutual respect. Communities, again, external university, internal university, and you will see that through the, the proliferation of outstanding young scientists in earth sciences who now have fantastic careers who, who originally came here to work with Steve. And I think all of those things are really central to the mission of the Cabot Institute. <coughs> Working across boundaries, but with respect for one another, and in so doing, building strong community. So I'm not going to say any more, but I do want to present the, well, this just you. And, and Kathy, can you come up as well? <laughs> right. And of course, we'll do the obligatory photo. <laughs> challenged 
when it comes to natural <laughs> hazards, except floods, and we saw about plenty of those this year. Um, I wanted to give you a, a, then a small example of the way Steve operates. Um, he's done many, many things in his career, has worked on every conceivable aspect of volcanoes, as far as I can tell. Um, and, but to everything, he's brought really a remarkable both breadth and depth to the problem that's been unmatched by anyone else in the field. And one example relates to something that started in July of 1995, and that is a volcano named Superior Hills in the island of Montserrat uh, started to become restless. And Montserrat is a British overseas territory, and all of a sudden the British government was in the <coughs> unexpected position of having to handle a volcano crisis. And as always in a volcano crisis, they turned to Steve. And Steve, characteristically, didn't just participate in the response, but he put together a, a huge multidisciplinary team. And uh, they first of all established a modern volcano monitoring center in Montserrat. Uh, they developed new methods of volcano hazard and risk analysis many of which have been you know, brought to the Cabot. And also, uh, he really brought together a large team to do a, a very detailed scientific study of, of fundamental volcanic processes. And as a result, Sophia Hills is now one of the premier uh, type volcanoes in the world because it is uh, more completely understood than just about any other. And more recently, Steve followed the same pattern with the 2010 AF Yatniokal eruption and response to the aviation crisis. So I could go on, but you're here to hear Steve, not me. So I'll give you Steve Sparks. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Tim, Rich, and Kathy, for such a, a nice introduction. Um, and it's perhaps to start before I begin the talk. It's probably just worth, it's a great opportunity to say I've been at Bristol since 1989 and one of the great pleasures of Bristol is just having so many great collaborators and that's collaborators all for the way from professors in different departments, maths, engineering, uh, geography and so forth who I've collaborated with and of course particularly in the School of Earth Science and research students and postdoctoral researchers. And I'll uh, be mentioning so, uh, some of those to, in the talk today, uh, just as a recognition of that sort of collaboration and team spirit that's been developed. So what I'm going to do today is talk about volcanic processes. And I'm going to uh, perhaps just start off with a nice picture by the Mexican surrealist painter, Dr. Atl, of a eruption of a little Mexican volcano called Perucatine in uh, 1943. I rather like this painting because he shows little tornadoes developing from the bottom of the ash cloud which are related to vortices in the ash plume uh, being stretched and this uh, other instability which is related to putting a lot of dense ash in the atmosphere and getting density instabilities uh, from the bottom of the cloud. So these are things which are really observed uh, in, uh, in ash clouds and I think it's uh, uh, a wonderful uh, painting. And so the outline of the talk, I'm going to start off in a very general way because it's about 50 years since the grand theory of the earth plate tectonics was developed and you really can't talk about volcanoes without talking about plate tectonics to begin with. So I'll talk, I'll start with a rather general introduction and then I'll move on uh, to uh, a number of topics, explosive eruptions, transitions and cycles in volcanic eruptions, some new concepts and uh, talk. Uh, finish off with some work, current work I'm doing. And this talk will in a sense pro be progressive because we'll start in a very general way and as you'll see uh, during the talk I'll start to talk more and more about some of the research that's gone on in Bristol and some of the work that we've done with collaborators. So just starting off with the, uh, a map of the earth and again this is the really the understanding of volcanism in the earth took a huge uh, uh, leap forward in the early 1960s with the development of the plate tectonics and of course it was the location of volcanoes in places like Chile and the Cascades uh, and in the big rift valleys going through ice of the ocean that realized that most volcanoes are associated with the boundaries of plates. And if we look at um, uh, a rather general depiction of, what, of plate tectonics we can see 
that um, where plates, uh, the volcanoes occur in the Earth where the plates pull apart and also where one plate pushes underneath another plate. Now, most of the inside of the Earth is essentially a crystalline solid, but it's a very hot solid, and so it's very near its melting temperature. And it's really only at the plate boundaries, by and large, there's some exceptions like Hawaii, it's only at the plate boundaries where processes lead to uh, the, this hot material quite close to its melting point, but still solid, starting to melt. And that's why we have volcanoes. It's because at the interior of the Earth, or the beata solid, is very close to its melting point, and therefore we don't have to do uh, too much to uh, uh, melt the rocks. Now, one of the great advances, and for, I think for young scientists in the geosciences, this isn't perhaps quite so dramatic, but this is um, uh, GPS movements in Japan, and these arrows represent the speeds of the plate, of one plate, the Pacific Ocean and the, the Philippine plate, pushing underneath Japan, and it shows the relative motions of the plates on GPS signals. This is a very new, of course, relatively new technology. And what's really remarkable about this, you can see that these arrows, the length is in millimetres per year, so you can see one plate coming in at around eight and seven, seven or eight centimetres per year, uh, pushing against another plate, is the fact that in the 1960s, when people worked out plate tectonics, they worked out plate velocities uh, over millions of years. That's all they could do. And they worked out velocities. And what's remarkable is there's almost perfect agreement between the velocities estimated in the 1960s over, uh, you know, over um, millions of years and uh, 20 or 30, 20 years of GPS data. And you get the same, essentially the same results. I think that's absolutely remarkable demonstration of the, of the theory of plate tectonics. Now, if we move on to uh, why the Earth melts, if we go to the places where the plates are pulled apart, um, you can see here there's something called the lithosphere. This is the rigid outer surface of the Earth being pulled apart. And most of the inside of the Earth, the Earth's mantle, is made of this greeny stuff, which is um, essentially called peridotite. It's, uh, it's made of magnesium silicates. And when we go to the volcanoes at the ridge, what, we ca what comes out is something called basalt. And we know that this basalt, a uh, rather viscous, sticky, hot liquid, is different from the interior of the Earth. We can understand how it forms. It melts because as you go down in pressure, this is pressure and depth in the Earth, so this is a diagram of temperature against pressure, this line here that's called the solidus is the temperature at which this material first melts. And if you're deep in the Earth at, say, some temperature like 13 or 1400 degrees centigrade, as the plates pull apart, the material rises up and decompresses and it eventually, because of the, the, essentially, you could say the melting temperature of the Earth increases with depth, as this material rises up, it intersects the melting temperature and the Earth melts just underneath the places where the plates are being pulled apart. So, so the main cause of volcanoes where plates are being pulled apart is decompression melting. It's nothing to do with heating anything up. In fact, things cool down a little bit. Now, of course, we can melt but we don't produce a great deal of melt, perhaps 5 or 10%. And the question is, how do we get that melt out? And you can see on the microscopic scale um, some of the ideas that around all these crystals are little tiny bits of melt which are lighter than the solid. And essentially, because they're lighter, buoyancy becomes the dominant feature, and that melt then separates. And if we look at a, a bit of an analogue, if we pour ourselves a pint of Guinness, you've probably seen that the bubbles separate from the liquid. And you might have, if, you, if you're a very connoisseur of Guinness, might have noticed that there's sort of little waves that take place uh, as the bubbles separate. You see sort of what look like waves as the, uh, the two liquids of different density come apart. And essentially, although there's some detail differences, the physics is very similar. Down in the Earth's interior, where we've melted the rock, we have solids and melt in between, and this, the, the buoyancy forces causes this melt to compact, or if we shear this material, the melt separates, and we get a separation, a spontaneous separation of pure melt from this mixture of solid and melt. So uh, the melt's light and will separate from the crystalline mantle to form melt layers. So that's how we think it separates, and you'll see later, uh, towards the end of the talk, um, 
uh, uh, some details about that. And just to have a look at an example of where the plates are being pulled apart, and we've got basalt coming apart in Iceland, we've got the plates separating at two and a half centimetres per year, and we've got the same process going on, the hot mantle melting, that melt separating, and then uh, the earth cracks along the boundary between the plates, and we get the basalt lava pouring out. Same thing is happening in the Afar Rift um, uh, in, uh, in uh, northeast Africa. And again, here we've got uh, the start of some, a plate, perhaps a plate boundary, with, and we've got uh, here the, the big the fractures are down the East African Rift. And again, this is just a wonderful, uh, very lucky to have a uh, young colleague, um, uh, Juliet Biggs in the department, who specializes in this area. And uh, these are some of the sorts of images that she produces of the rifting in 1970, 2007 and 2009. You can see radar image where two radar images are taken, uh, one uh, perhaps a few weeks after the other, and then when the topographies are compared and separated, you get an interferogram where each of these um, lines represents 10 centim something like 10 centimetres of uplift or subsidence. And, and these little black uh, dots here are the earthquakes, and this is a massive fissure, something like 60 or 70 kilometres long, You've got earthquakes, this happened in 2007 and 2009, where the whole of this part of the East African rifts spread apart by several metres uh, in just a couple of years. So essentially we've got uh, several hundred years worth of plate separation just in a couple of years. And that's, it works in this sort of episodic way. Uh, and again, we get this um, uh, wonderful technology is providing us wonder, great insights and data. Now, okay, so that's enough about the where plates separate and we get volcanoes. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about where plates collide and one goes beneath the other. And it's not quite so obvious why we would get volcanoes there because we're pushing something cold back into the Earth. The plate has cooled at the Earth's surface and it's been pushed um, uh, uh, down. But the clue is if we go to the ridges and we look at what's happening at the volcanoes at the ridges, we find these hot springs on the ocean floor called black smokers where hot water is mixing with the hot lava and generating plumes of hot material that come out of the ocean and so the whole of the plate gets saturated and reacts with water. And when it's pushed down, this water uh, is then released and moves up into the rocks above the plate which is being pushed down. Now if we look at, again, the melting relationships and just look at this diagram, this is what the, most of the Earth's interior is made of, a peridotite. And we've already seen that it's, if it's dry, there's no water around. It's got a very high melting temperature. But if we add just a little bit of water, then the melting temperature comes down by hundreds of degrees centigrade. It's just the same as putting salt on an icy road to make it melt. If we add a bit of water in the Earth's interior, we melt it, make it melt. And so the, uh, all we have to do is to get this water we formed here and push it into the hot mantle and we melt because of the addition of water to the hot rocks down there and that's why we get volcanoes in places like Chile and, uh, and the Cascades. Again, to, uh, just to highlight uh, the technology, we now have wonderful studies of the Earth's interior. We can see these zones. This is in Japan where the Pacific Plate is going down beneath Japan and using what's a process called seismic tomography where uh, seismologists look at waves coming through the earth you can see regions which have got what's called a shear wave anomaly in other words red and they've color coded this so uh, in these areas we uh, really can only explain these anomalies and the, the slowness of which seismic waves go through this end area by having melt down there so we can actually image uh, image the interior uh, of the Earth. And this is a plan view of what it's like uh, perhaps 50 kilometers down beneath Japan. And you can see these regions with melt. And then we can do cross sections. And again, this is just showing you uh, what the new technology can do. We can see the, the, the earthquakes at the top of the slab. We can see that this, this region's blue because the, because the material is uh, cold down there. Um, and it's, a f it's a sort of fast. And then in between, there are these red blobs and orange blobs, 
where the seismic waves are slowed down by the presence of melt. So we can actually image these processes going on. Now, uh, why, uh, wh why do we, what happens with volcanoes? Well, okay, we've generated some melt and magma either by pulling plates apart or pushing them together. In one place, decompression, the other water. And now we, it would be simple. Does the, in the case of the Iceland and the Afar, the magma seems to come up. But when we look at volcanoes, it's not nearly as simple as that. Um, but because magmas tend to get stuck in the crust. Uh, here's Monorovsky volcano from Kamchatka, and this is a, in, a, in an arc. And uh, essentially, what happens is that uh, magmas may get stuck because they're too dense. Uh, they'd like to rise up to the surface, but th this simple concept doesn't usually work. You, uh, very often the magmas get stuck because they have to push their way through the cold rocks of the crust and they can get uh, stuck very easily. And this starts to move a little bit to uh, some work that um, John Blundy and Katrina N in, in, the, in the department did where we started to realize that magmas get stuck at all levels in the crust, forming layers and, uh, and vertical structures, but mostly horizontal layers called sills, and that this process is really very important to understanding how volcanoes work. Now, a lot of attention early on has, uh, in the subject has been paid what happens up here and immediately beneath the volcano, perhaps five to ten kilometers uh, along, and here you can see a picture of Antarctica, where you can see an example of some magmas getting stuck. They come up, they get close to the sur surface, but the rocks get too strong, uh, the magma's too dense, and instead of getting to the Earth's surface and erupting in a volcano, it pushes aside and forms a layer. And th that's one of these layers. And this was done in the fluid mechanics lab in, uh, in the department. Uh, uh, one of the PhD students, uh, Janine Cavanaugh, did very simple experiments of having a rigid elastic. So this is, uh, g this is uh, g uh, uh, gel, and uh, you can see here that some water is pushed in. And this, this upper layer, uh, this jelly, it's, it's essentially laboratory jelly, is a bit more stronger than this lower layer. And this, uh, the, uh, some fluid, is, some water is pushed in, and it's lighter than both of these. But you can see that what happens is that when it gets to this interface between a strong rock and a weak rock, it has this tendency to spread sideways. And we think this is one of the main mechanisms that stops magma getting to the surface. And when, of course, the magma does this once and it does it again, we can start building up something we call a magma chamber. So each injection comes in and uh, cools and solidifies and keeps the area hot. Then another one comes in. And with time, if enough of these come in, we'll start to form big bodies of magma in the crust, things we call magma chambers, which feed volcanoes. Now I'm going to come back to the topic of magma chambers towards the end of the, the talk. Uh, but um, I've, as I say, I'm now starting to introduce a little bit more of the work that's gone on in Bristol. So I'm going to change topic a little bit and go on to understanding explosive eruptions. And this is an opportunity to uh, uh, show again some collaborations within the university. Um, this is, uh, I think, Chai Ten in Chile, and you can see a, an explosive eruption of the volcano with a cloud perhaps about 20 kilometers high, um, and it's a very vigorous explosive eruption in which there's a turbulent, what we call a turbulent plume, which rises in the atmosphere and spreads out in something we call uh, an umbrella cloud. And as we know from the Iceland ash coming over Britain, uh, this is of some practical interest. Firstly, why do we get volcanoes exploding? Now, there's a, a number of reasons, but I think what the one I want to highlight here is the solubility of the gases. And in volcanoes, the, in most places, the most important gas is water. Remember in the subduction zones, all the plates going down, we take water down and that makes the rocks melt. So these rocks, magmas, are typically very rich in water. And here you see water against pressure, which shows you the solubility curve of a couple of different sorts of magma. 
and you can see that under high pressure, that's two kilobars, and that's roughly five or six kilometers depth in the Earth, we can dissolve quite a lot of water. It's dissolved in the melt. But if we go down to a very low pressure of the low Earth's atmosphere, we can hardly dissolve any at all. And indeed, when we take a piece of magma with a few percent water and take it up from five kilometers to the Earth's surface, the expansion of the gas is about a thousand-fold. Now, if the gas can't expand because the magma around it is too stiff and viscous, what happens is pressures build up and we get a volcanic explosion. And that's what you saw happening in the photograph. And this is just a cartoon to show you what happens. Here's our magma chamber that we're going to talk about in more detail later. It's rising up. As the solubility of the water goes down with pressure, bubbles start to form. And then the pressure becomes so great that the internal strength of the magma is exceeded and it fragments. And uh, this is the typical pressure. And then this mixture of fragmented magma, or ash, and gas expands up the conduit and injects into the atmosphere at hundreds of meters per second. And that's essentially the driving force for volcanic eruptions. Again, the, the Fluid Mechanics Lab in Bristol, we've uh, studied these processes, uh, particularly Jeremy Phillips and Heidi Maeder have led a number of shock tube experiments where here we take some acetone dissolved in pine resin uh, underneath the vacuum, we dissolve it under pressure and the pressure is released and we get an explosive bubbling flow that <coughs> takes place and uh, uh, essentially the, it's uh, an analog for this process. So we can't go down a volcano and directly measure what's happening in an explosive eruption so our next best bet is to do an experiment in the laboratory and understand the physics uh, uh, that way. And we can understand from the labs what happens in these explosive eruptions. So that's our fundamental cause of explosive eruptions. Um, if we then look at what happens once this very high speed jet or flow gets into the atmosphere, then it's a bit like the back of a jet engine. It mixes turbulently with the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere is cold and the material coming out of the volcano is hot, the mixture, the air mixed into the hot jet heats up dramatically and two things can happen. That mixing can result in the whole, the material coming out of the volcano is always denser than the atmosphere. That's always the case. And so the only way to make it go up high is to mix it with air and heat it and that process takes place in the plume. Now sometimes that mixing is so efficient that the whole mixture uh, this is, uh, uh, becomes buoyant and it rises up and forms one of those giant clouds I showed you in the photograph. And other times it doesn't, is not successful in mixing, but actually, although it mixes with air, it never gets dent lighter than the surrounding atmosphere and it runs out of kinetic energy and then it collapses down in a little, in something where it's not particularly little, a fountain, which uh, this uh, laser pointer is not doing so well, um, but it basically rises up, runs out of kinetic energy before it can become lighter than the atmosphere, and it collapses down. Now, what's great about doing laboratory experiments, and these are some of the work we did in the early 90s, is that you can reproduce this in an extraordinarily simple experiment. These are both tanks of salty water, and there's a nozzle there, and in one experiment, we mix fresh water and particles and inject it in, and the fresh water acts like the hot air, and it goes upwards, and we get something like this. In the other experiment, uh, we put in more particles so that the mixture coming out of the, of the nozzle, the mixture of particles and fresh water is denser than the salty water, and it can't become buoyant, and so it then collapses down and forms a a flow. And these are called pyroclastic, these current density currents are called pyroclastic flow. They account for about 40% of the casualty, of fatalities in volcanic eruptions. So they're, one, they're the, 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 the number one hazard if you're interested in hazards prevention. Okay, so 
we now uh, look at uh, some of the features. You can get, uh, if the discharge from the volcano is, is low, it's a weak eruption, then we're putting really rather modest amount of heat into the atmosphere, so we get a low plume, which can be easily bent over by the plume. But if we're in the Philippines looking from the sky and look at the scale, if we've got a really gigantic eruption where the discharge rate of the magma is four orders of magnitude more than this one, then it forms one of these giant umbrella clouds that you saw in the photograph. This is from space. Look at the scale, nearly 400 kilometers in diameter. Completely ignores the wind. So we've got this huge spectrum of behavior. And these are the things that we're trying to uh, understand better. Now, from a practical point of view, um, if we were uh, uh, the Met Office and we wanted to forecast how much ash was going to come across Britain, the thing we'd want to know is how much ash goes into the atmosphere per unit time so that we can then have a source term which we can use to make a meteorological forecast of where the ash goes and whether we can fly planes or not. And it turns out that there's a relationship between the height of the plume and the mass flux of ash, which is a quarter power. And I like this slide because, um, or this relationship, because this is the data, column height. This is the height of the eruption column against volume eruption rate. And I already said that this could be over several orders of magnitude. And you see that this relationship really works quite well. Now, there's a story here because um, G.I. Taylor, a very famous applied mathematician in Cambridge, worked this out in the early 1950s with his students. He did experiments with salty water and fresh water, and he worked out the, the scaling rules which governed how high plumes went in the atmosphere. Now, he worked out that it should be a quarter power. When we collected all the data from the volcanoes, and compared it with uh, G.I. Taylor's prediction of the 1950s, we found that it agreed very well. So that curve is not a regression curve. That is the original Taylor expression. So as geophysical data goes, that's really quite good. So uh, now, the main point about this is that this is the formula. We, we demonstrated uh, early on that this formula sort of worked. And this is the formula that the Met Office, in fact, all the ash forecasting uh, uh, organizations around the world use to forecast volcanic ash, where it's going to go and how much there is of it. And it's worked quite well uh, for quite a while. But um, unfortunately, in uh, the 2010, when this ash from I'm thinking Kathy pronounced it much better than I did. Uh, so we found that this, uh, it looked that like this sort of general formula didn't work too well when you had a strong wind. And we also observed that during this eruption, you got extremely thin layers, which really could not be easily explained. So we come right up to uh, very recent research on this and uh, pay tribute to, I think, uh, uh, Mark Woodhouse and Andy Hogg in the maths department, School of Mathematics, Jerry Phillips and myself, was looking and uh, principally uh, uh, Andy and uh, Mark worked out the theory. And what we worked out was that the height of the eruption column was related to the wind speed. The higher the wind speed, the lower the eruption column. And this was a dramatic effect now, we won't need to go into too great a detail that this WS parameter is the wind speed divided by a stratification parameter in the atmosphere. And this is the relative height. So if there was no wind, it would go up to a height of 1. But if there was quite a strong wind, it would only go up to a height of 0.5. So it would go up to, to half what you'd expect it for a given mass flux. Now, the important point is that if you use that simple formula not taking into account the wind, you'd come up with a, a great uh, an underestimate of how much ash was put into the atmosphere by about an order of magnitude. 
And that's huge for forecasting. So essentially, we've, uh, been, we've published a paper on this. We've put it online so people around the world, there's a, a Bristol-based um, site which um, has been set up. And you can click on that. And this has now got 11, it's put up about several months ago. It's got 11,000 hits and it's being used worldwide to make this correction for the wind. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where this uh, is, is going. And what you can see is these are radar images of the heights of the plume from Iceland. So this is the height the plume went. And uh, the mass flux that you calculate with the wrong formula, um, and if you put the right formula in with the center of the wind, it looks like the volcano is chugging out the material at the same rate all the time. So um, that's a sort of practical aspect. And then, uh, again, a colleague in maths, Chris Johnson, a postdoctoral researcher, and colleagues from different uh, parts of the world and School of Mathematics, we've been working together. And we've been finding also that the way that the cloud spreads uh, is, uh, uh, can account for the, uh, this, these very thin layers. Now, this is the simple idea that if you have an eruption column, you mix up the atmosphere, and what you do is you store potential energy by that big umbrella cloud comes up, it mixes the atmosphere essentially, and that creates potential energy, and that layer wants to thin, and it wants to thin rapidly. And so what we've been able to do is, and this is Chris Johnson's work, of uh, do model plumes of an ash cloud spreading uh, downwind, and where it's red, it's thick, and where it's blue, it's thin, and we can essentially explain that rapid thinning that we observe uh, in the data. And again, that rapid thinning is very important for understanding the forecasting. Um, this is comparison with the, sh the, the model with the shape of the plume that came over Britain, and it's looking quite encouraging. And we've got a sort of paper in, in the review process with Nature just at the moment on that. So that's... Um, uh, through explosive eruption, so it's taken you from sort of some of the general ideas to some of the much more recent work where we're trying to understand this thinning and the effects of the wind. And now I'd like to again change uh, tack. I'd, um, as Cathy said, this is my favourite volcano. It's the Soufre Hills, where we've been, uh, been working with people from Bristol uh, for really ever since 1995. It's in the Caribbean, uh, quite near to Antigua. Um, up there. It's quite a small island and it has been erupting ever, pretty well ever since the last 17 years. Um, you might just about see a, a big explosive eruption that took place on the island, um, I think back in 2003 this was, um, and there you can see what the kind of lava that's produced which is a big hot, what we call a lava dome. Now this sort of volcano is fascinating because unlike at the places where the plates go apart and we get basalt and it's very quite fluid and flows down the volcano quite easily, in the volcanoes where the plates push up together, for various reasons, there's two properties of them. Firstly, they're very much more viscous, the magmas, orders of magnitude more viscous. And so they're more like sort of sticky toothpaste in the way they behave. They don't flow down the hill they pile up and form what we call domes. They've also got a lot of water in them. And this volcanic water makes them have a propensity for explosions. So those are the two properties I want you to uh, be sort of thinking about. And we know that from observations uh, that if the rate of eruption, this is the amount, this is the rate at which the magma extrudes onto the Earth's surface, is rather slow. We get these sort of spines. It's a bit like um, if you've not used your toothpaste for a long time and it's all dried out and you try and squeeze it, then it's solidified and you get a solidified plug coming down. So, in other words, what's happened here is that in this part of the eruption where the extrusion is very slow, it's lost all its gas. And as I'll show you later, a consequence of losing all its gas is it solidifies. Remember, at the, where the plates go down, 
putting water down into the mantle makes the rocks melt. If you do the opposite, you take the water out of the magma, then they solidify spontaneously. And indeed, it's something that uh, 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 Cathy Cashman is very sort of famous for, sort of pointing that out in Mount St. Helens, that this process of solidification as you degas. So taking the water out means it solidifies and we get a spine. If we erupted rather faster, it doesn't have time to do so much solidifying, and so it pours out a little bit more liquid-like, and it can start to form a more b uh, blobby dome, a bit like a lump of viscous honey, and sometimes it forms pancakes. It's looking a bit more like a liquid than this, this slide. And then if the flow rate gets very large, around 10 cubic meters per second, it flips and it goes through a transition and you get an explosive eruption. So we can, and this is a very sensitive non-linear system, as I'll show you. So those are th the things we observe. And this really comes back to the point I was making uh, from Cathy's work that um, uh, uh, so if you get pressure and temperature, and these are the, these surfaces here, this is all melt, if I bring up the melt to the Earth's surface and it crosses these various curves, this is temperature grades pressure, as it gets close to the Earth's surface and it loses that gas, it will solidify and crystallize and become much more viscous. And uh, so we need to, and we can make some measurements of these properties by looking at the individual minerals. So the po main point is, how can we explain different eruption styles? The magma has water in it as it ascends. The magma solidifies as a consequence. And uh, the results are as follows. As for degassing, if we t push the magma up, gas bubbles form. And if those gas bubbles interconnect, the gas, and we move it up very slowly, that gas can leak out. Gas disappears, and we get a very viscous magma erupted, or a lava. If we erupt it rather more quickly, the gas forms, but it doesn't have time to escape. The pressure goes up, and we get an explosion. Now, this, of course, is hiding a lot of really interesting physics and maths, which I don't have time to go into in great detail, but it's a very nonlinear system. We sort of get one or the other, and the sort of tipping points uh, and that's really what we observe. It gets, the flow rate just gets a little bit higher, and the gas can't escape. The pressure builds up, and it explodes. Now, let's have a look at some data from Montserrat. I want to take you th through this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some data which makes the point that volcanoes behave in very cyclic patterns. And I want to focus just for the moment on this diagram, um, which shows two sorts of data from Montserrat in 1997. And these are days. So this is about 10 days' worth of data. And these histograms here are numbers of earthquakes per hour. And this data is something called a tilt meter, which is an electronic spirit level which sits on the volcano. And when the pressure goes up, the angle goes up. And when the pressure goes down, the angle goes down. And so you can imagine this instrument here, with the axis on the right, as a pressure meter. And you can see that over a few days, uh, 10 days, the activity is very, very cyclic, with a time scale of something like a, uh, a few, uh, eight or nine hours. And the explosions and the pyroclastic flows that we get are always <coughs> in this period, always occurred at the peak in pressure. So we had a pattern that, first of all, we need, that's very useful for making forecasts. We recognize a pattern. And then we recognize that that pattern is uh, something to do with um, the dynamics of the system. Now, again, I won't go into detail, but we, if we go back to this idea, whoops, <laughs> just had a catastrophic <laughs> flow. Um, if we go back to the... Uh, the idea that I want to get across is we can imagine pressure building up. We get an explosion or an extrusion. The pressure goes down and the flow rate goes down. And we can imagine a sort of oscillating system. And this is really to do with the 
interplay of the loss of gas and the friction of the magma coming up the tube uh, is causing this very short-term cycles. If we look at the same data over several weeks, every time you see a line, that's a swarm of earthquakes, and, every, and this is the same instrument, the tilt meter, and you can now see another pattern that's about six or seven weeks uh, in length. And the big eruptions on Montserrat always take place within a few hours or days, a couple of days, of that change of pattern. And so what we're seeing is another cyclic pattern to the activity. Now, so this becomes, even if we don't understand what that pattern means, we can use that pattern to forecast, but of course scientifically it's really interesting to know what that pattern is caused by. Now, volcanoes are fed by fractures in the crust, which allow magma to pass, move up them, and as a fracture forms, there's an interaction between the elastic pushing the rocks apart and the pressure, and because the flow rate is dependent on the cube of the width, it's a very strong dependence, it means that you can get a resonance or pattern of oscillation or resonance between the elastic pushing part to the rock, the flow pressure, and the flow rate. Now, I won't go into the detail except to say a very talented uh, PhD student and myself and Joe Gotsman, Steffi Houtman, has made a very convincing case that that's the explanation for this six or seven week pattern of activity. So we've got this sort of non-linear system. Now, if we look um, at over several years, 15 years of activity, you can see earthquake swarms and you can see up here, and the red is when lava is extruding. So you can see a pattern, a larger scale, time scale pattern of extrusion and non-extrusion over the years. So the volcano is very cyclic. You can also see this is GPS data. And so just look at this red curve for the moment. That red curve is the ground going up and down. And you can see that when the ground, when it's green, there's no activity, the ground is going up, and that's because the magma chamber is swelling. And when the lava comes out, the ground collapses as the lava comes out of the, of the earth, and the pressure goes down. And then finally, just look at this, the sulfur dark side flux, and I'm going to show you, link this late, a little bit later. You can see the, there's enormous amounts of sulfur dark side coming out of this volcano and it's got some sort of oscillatory pattern to it but look that it isn't very well connected with the pattern related to the lava so that's really quite interesting what's going on well working with a colleague from Moscow State University of Applied Maths Oleg Melnik long-term collaborator uh, again I won't dwell on this but we have a classic sort of non-linear hysteristics curve of the behavior of volcanoes which we think can explain this yearly pattern. We have flow rate and magma chamber pressure. So now we're going to have a time scale which is related to a big blob of magma in the crust interacting with its elastic surroundings. And the idea behind this model is simply here we have flow rate against magma chamber pressure. When you look at the equations you find that in certain regimes there's several answers for exactly the same conditions. This is a, a nonlinear dynamical system. And the way we think it works is something like this, that if we have magma rising very fast, it can't solidify and flows out quickly. If it rises slowly, it starts to crystallize as a feedback. As it starts to solidify, it becomes more stiff and viscous and their flow rate drops down, and we oscillate between these two states. So we start a day, we increase the magma pressure, so the chamber pressure here, so the flow rate goes up, we get to this point, and then there's no stable flow to the right of that, so it has to jump to this high state, and then at this high state, it's erupting fast, so the pressure goes down, 
and we go round in a cycle. And uh, we think that this sort of mechanism can explain what we're seeing on the volcano. So, okay. Um, okay, now let's um, just move on to a couple of other ideas. And I said we'd come back to magma chambers. So the idea we have is we've got the volcano, we've got this narrow crack that I mentioned before, and we've got the magma chamber. And a lot of the work on, magma ch on volcanoes and magma chambers is focused on this very shallow part of the system. So this is the uppermost five kilometers of the crust. But working with John Blundy and Kathy Cashman, we're starting to think that we need to look at this in a much larger scale. That volcanoes are actually not just one magma chamber, there's the one magma chamber up here just below the volcano, but underneath there's a whole plexus of magma bodies and chambers uh, in operation. And uh, this is called the, we're working on this, and we think that this model, this new model where we take account of what's going on at deeper and the formation of these layers has a lot of explanatory power for things we couldn't explain before. Now, this is a busy slide, so I'm going to take, try and take you through all the details. One of the things we can do around volcanoes, so to ignore the slide for the moment, is we can do some geology. We can go on the ground and, and get rocks and date layers which are formed from previous eruptions. We go on the ocean floor, we can take sediment cores, and we can find layers of ash, and we can date them. And therefore, one of the things we can do is we can come up with a very detailed picture of the time evolution or the history of a volcano. And that's what all these sort of geologically looking plots are. These are our history of, these, of the Montserrat volcano back to about 250,000 years. Now the main point, and this is some ash layers on the sea floor collected in one of the cruises we went on where we collected these, these ash layers. So these are our records of volcanic activity. Now, the only thing I really want you to notice is that the blue, uh, the blue and reds occur over 300,000 years, and the actual eruptions are really quite short-lived, maybe a few years, maybe a few decades. So most of the time, this volcano is doing absolutely nothing. And the activity occurs in very, very short bursts of activity. And that's the important point about this slide and why I've got fast, slow. In volcanoes, we have slow processes where magma's accumulating and doing its thing, and uh, nothing's happening at the surface, but things are going on underground. And then we have fast processes when we get eruptions. So that's the basic idea. Now, firstly, a little bit of uh, ideas about, that we're developing about the slow processes. And Firstly, just look at this side of the, sl at the slide, and here's some of the collaborators in this. Um, uh, here we see one of Catherine and N's diagrams, and we've got these horizontal layers that we talked about earlier on, which are progressively intruding or adding into the crust at the bottom. And as they do, they lose heat, but they also, if they're hot enough, they retain some melt. And then if we go back to the Guinness, analogy, that melt wants to separate, it wants to move up from its solid. So as these layers of magma crystallize, the melt will start to move up. And when you look at the physics of these waves, you find that it forms a large number of little waves of melt. So this diagram here, if we look at this, this is the amount of melt, 20% to 80%, and you can see these are layers of melt-rich and melt-poor. So the basic idea from this diagram is not the details, it's the fact that we can form layer, lots and lots of layers of melt. And these layers of melt are unstable. Now you can also see, and again the details don't matter, that we can do computer models of this process, and we come up that depending on all sorts of things, for example like how fast we intrude the magma, we get layers of different scales, uh, and so we can get different size layers on different time scales by playing around with the parameters which control this. And this then leads to an extremely simple model, but one we really like, 
because, uh, partly because it sort of rather b blows away some of the thought, the sort of fundamental thoughts that have been around for perhaps as much as 100 years of how you get instabilities to cause volcanic activity. And it's not a, it's not, these are not mutually exclusive, I should say. This is not an alternative, it's an additional idea. But given that we've, somewhere in the crust, we've created layer, we've cre created magmas which have stalled and they've created melt, and that these layers can then form layers, and then if I can add some, if they've also liberating some gas, we can get some layers of gas as well as layers of magma, then if this whole system, which is such a layers of light melt in between dense layers of crystals, that's unstable. If this system goes unstable, then we can reorganize all this material, put all these layers at the top and the gas, and because we've brought these layers from depth and they come to low pressure, they start to form a lot of new gas, and they also bring this deep gas. And so we can reorganize the whole system and I think account for quite a lot of features of volcanic activity. And I'm going to sort of just show you, uh, probably drawing towards the end, um, just some data we've got which shows you some, some of the observations we're making. This is from Montserrat and this is the sulfur dioxide content uh, and you can see that it varies over about three years and these are the earthquakes and you'll see that there are spikes of sulfur dioxide. Now what's happening and these are sulfur dioxide spikes associated with the earthquakes. It's easiest to show you what's happening in a photograph. When this happens over a, a number of hours you typically, what we see is that the gas fumoles or the cracks on the dome which are delivering gas from depth are activated much more gas comes out of these fumoles and new fractures form so what's happening is that in this system gas is accumulating bursting through to the surface in short bursts delivering only gas and not magma okay so the gas is decoupled from the ma magma because they've got very different physical properties, essentially. And we used a... One of the things we did on Montserrat was we put this instrument in. It's a borehole strain meter observatory. We put th uh, four of them. Three of them are shown here. This is the world's most sensitive geophysical instrument. And what this does is it allows us to measure in nano strains the movements of magma and gases underground. And so, when these degassing events happen that I mentioned, so a, a gas at depth comes up through a crack and, and discharges without its magma, these are the strain signals that we get from the movement of those gases. So we can measure those in a this very sensitive geophysical instrument. Now, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but Steffi Hauptmann, again, PhD student and then uh, now postdoc in the department has done some really very nice work and what she's been able to demonstrate is before these events we get patterns of a deep 10 kilometer region of pressurization or decompression uh, before the eruption we see the deep placed at 10 kilometers pressure going down and in the shallow magma chamber, we see the pressure going down. But in the dike system near the surface, we see the pressure going up. So gas is coming up and accumulating. And then when the gas comes out, the pressure goes down here and it goes up uh, at deeper level. So what we're tracking is the movement of gas from depths of an order 10 kilometers, which is much deeper than uh, uh, anyone had uh, supposed. OK. so. So this brings along to the sort of uh, just the, uh, the, the final idea, you're probably, uh, for not, not quite final, the, the one I just want to tell you a little bit about. You probably know we're funded by BHP Billiton, the world's biggest mining company, to look at copper. And principally through some, uh, some very nice work that John Blundy 
has done, coupled with our understanding of volcanoes, we've come up with a, an idea about how you form copper deposits. And the idea is, here's our magma chamber, and what it turns out is that copper likes to associate chemically with chlorine. And so we think that in these systems, chlorine and brines are very important for transporting copper to the place. I should have mentioned that copper deposits are old eroded volcanoes. That's the first thing you need to know, uh, I guess. So we're looking at most world's copper deposits are the erosion of an old volcano like Montserrat. And the copper is transported in the chlorine, but the ore is made of sulfide or sulfur. And, that's and everyone up to now has been trying to make the copper and the sulfur be transported together and it doesn't basically make a lot of geochemical sense. So what uh, John uh, uh, has done is to suggest the following, that chlorine is a gas which dissolves very easily in magmas at shallow pressure, where sulfur will degas at depth. So there's a very large difference of solubility between sulfur and chlorine gases. When we have a shallow chamber degassing, it's already lost its sulfur, but it's got its chlorine, and so it, in the, those slow periods, it can lose its gas and accumulate essentially a brine full of copper above the magma chamber and the, in, in the volcano. Now we have a fast process where we destabilize all those deep layers very rapidly, and we bring up hotter magma, more basaltic magma. This is high temperature magma, which can dissolve a lot more sulfur because it's at depth and because it's much more soluble in those sorts of magmas, we can destabilize them and mix them together, and the sulfur dark, dark side can come up, and being a chemist, I have a one chemical reaction. Uh, this is the one that John proposes, that sulfur gases react with the brine to form what we get in a copper, which is a copper sulfide uh, deposit, and then that liberates a lot of hydrochloric acid, and that hydrochloric acid attacks the surrounding rocks and produces a lot of the other features that we see in the ore bodies. So that's the basic idea. And you can see how some of the ideas that I've been talking about. Uh, here's Amy Gilmer's um, uh, rocks from Chile we've been looking at over the uh, last uh, year or so. And here we've got what we found was mixing between two different magmas, a deep magma of basalt and a shallow magma. Uh, and indeed we found in the copper, porphyry copper deposit, we found this association which is consistent with the uh, theory. But uh, J John and Brian Tatich and John Mavroginis, a visitor from ANU, did, uh, weren't content with that. They've, in the laboratory of the Wills Memorial Building, they've put some basalt with its sulfur in it and some dacite. This is, a, this is, the, this is the, ma the shallow magma with its chlorine in it. And then they've put it, cooked it up and then the sulfur comes in here, reacts with the chlorine here, and forms nice little cracks full of copper sulfide. So we've, we've made a porphyry copper deposit in the, or uh, John, the John, John and Brian have made a porphyry copper deposit in the uh, uh, Wills Memorial Building basement. So I think it's, um, uh, but uh, I think you can see that that sort of idea emerges out of collaboration because we've had to bring in we brought in the petrology expertise like John and geochemistry, like John and, uh, John and Brian. And then with the field expertise and the understanding of the volcanoes, we can start to really understand how these system works. OK, I'm going to give you one last very quick topic um, to finish off. This is something I've been working on for about five years, and that is to gather a database of the world's explosive eruptions. And what this shows is data over the last 10,000 years of eruption magnitude. Uh, Sarah Brown and Sh uh, Sean Crosswell have been working uh, extensively over the last four or five years to create this database. And it shows you the magnitude of an eruption, uh, M, which is defined as the mass erupted in kilograms, minus, log of that mass minus seven. I'll uh, explain why minus seven a little bit later, but it makes it like earthquakes because the biggest eruptions are about nine and the biggest earthquakes are about nine, so it's quite convenient. 
all these dots are our data. This is back about two years ago, so we've got a lot more data since then. And what I want you to show you is that if you look at the small eruptions, the fours, you can see there's a lot more of them than the big eruptions. So they're just like earthquakes. Big eruptions are much rarer than small eruptions. You can also see, if I go back in time, the number of dots decreases because the, the small eruptions aren't preserved very well or aren't recorded very well. On the other hand, the dots do decrease back, but not so dramatically for very big eruptions because those get preserved in the geological record. Now, uh, the thing about this, if what you really need is a, uh, to work with great statisticians. And so uh, earlier on, I worked with Stuart Cole, who's not here, is in the School of Stats, and more recently, John T. Rougier, to try and unwrap. It's no point in a geologist with very simple minded statistics trying to work this out. We might as well get some really good statisticians to help us. And so we've been working on this database. And what we've come up with. Um, and this is a simplification because I'm not showing the uncertainties, but this is the magnitude return period curve for global volcanism, which we've extracted from this database. So this is equivalent of the Gutenberg-Richter relationship for earthquakes. And so it's taken a huge amount of work to get a simple result, but it's very interesting. And I, again, I'm not going to talk in detail, but you can see that it behaves like a power law, a log, this is a log-log plot, with a, uh, very like earthquakes, but then when it gets to about seven, it curves over, and we're, we believe that that's statistically meaningful, that, that, that that's actually what's happening, and so we're finding that the bigger eruptions behave differently from the smaller eruptions, and there's some really intriguing science questions around why that should be. So uh, that's what we're doing, and we're using this data to deliver a, uh, in fact, it's this main project I'm involved in at the moment, is we're doing the first assessment, uh, Bristol's leading the first assess global assessment of volcanic risk for the UN, and we've got a report to finish off by the, the end of this month, and this sort of data is feeding into that global assessment. So I'm going to finish off with a painting um, of uh, uh, Mark Rothko, the, the, the great uh, American uh, modern artist, um, his version of a, a magma, of a magma chamber. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>